Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader. Today, our guest is Norman, author of Wild Thing, The Short, Spellbinding Life of Jimi Hendrix, published by Live Right in September of this odd year. Philip is one of my favorite authors because he writes about some of my favorite musicians and idols. And some of those idols that he's written about are The Beatles, Paul McCartney, Eric Clapton, The Stones, John Lennon, Elton John, who might not be my favorite, and last and not only least, but perhaps the most, Buddy Holly. And he's also written another six works of fiction and two plays. So, Jimi Hendrix, the last time I saw him was at Temple University Field on May 16, 1970. I remember it like yesterday, although I was in an altered state of mind, which was pretty much de rigueur at that time. It was an incredible concert, among other bands, The Grateful Dead, Steve Miller, Cactus, and I can't, I can't remember the others. Uh, he played Sgt. Pepper's, Machine Gun, Foxy Lady, Red House, Purple Haze. I would have to say he wasn't at his best, but that was better than any guitarist I ever heard. And I saw Blind Faith on their one and only tour. So the time before that was at Woodstock, although they say if you remember Woodstock, then you weren't there. Plus, we had a golf ball-sized chunk of pharmaceutical opium, so that may have factored in. I was in my first year of college, and on September 18th, 1970, my world was changed, as it was almost a year later when Jim Morrison died. Um, Jimmy's life and membership in the 27 Club was one that was tragic, heroic, and fascinating, or the word Philip uses most appropriately, spellbinding. As in all his other rock books, he gives us the outside picture, but more vividly and riveting is his picture from the inside. Also, just to give you some context regarding another horrible day in my life, today is the 40th anniversary of the death of John Lennon. So welcome, Phillips, and thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. And as we were talking before, and I'll ask you again, so was Jimmy the best guitarist of all time? I certainly think so, and I'm not alone. And all of the guitar superheroes of that era, that great era of the solid body electric guitar, the first great epoch, everyone said the same. Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck, Pete Townsend, George Harrison, they only had to listen to Jimmy once, and they simply surrendered. They said, there is no competing with this man. He really created what came to be called heavy metal rock, which was an extraordinary thing to do because um, African-American musicians were then supposed to stay in the genres which they'd always belonged to. Uh, soul, blues, R&B. Jimmy crossed over that frontier. He was a wonderful blues guitarist and R&B guitarist, but he played white heavy metal rock to a very largely white audience. Um, that was an extraordinary thing to do at that time. Um, but as well as having this ex extraordinary virtuosity, making guitars make sounds they simply had never been coerced into making before. He added to that, he didn't have to have showmanship as well as that. Most of those other great guitar heroes didn't bother with showmanship. They stood there looking tortured, perhaps they were tortured. <laughs> Jimmy added this extraordinary showmanship, showmanship that really uh, the great showman of the rock stage, Jim Morrison, uh, Mick Jagger, really, they couldn't compete with that either. So it was, it was a double, double thing with Jimmy, an extraordinary combination. There's two good stories along with that. One would be the first time that Eric saw him when he jammed in, and the second would be the quite poignant uh, incident when Peter Townsend and um, Eric Clapton were holding hands in the audience. You could tell us those two, because those are two great stories. Well, um, the, the strange thing was that Jimmy w w was very ambivalent. He had to come to London, you see, to, get, to, to, to make his name, because in America at that time, um, African-American musicians, even the most famous ones, really had to sort of play in segregated venues. And Jimmy was simply a sideman to other people like Little Richard and Wilson Pickett. But he was discovered by um, Chaz, or not actually discovered, but he was signed up by Chaz Chandler of the Animals, who wanted to move into management. And he came to London. He didn't really know if he wanted to come to London. What really decided him was that he would meet Eric Clapton. Well, of course, 
the first time he played on stage, he asked us, he, he sat in, as it was put, with a new band Clapton was in called Cream, a three piece. Um, and <laughs> sitting in had nothing to do with it. I mean, his showmanship was so extraordinary as well as his completely effortless switching from amazing uh, fretboard wizardry to uh, incredibly highly charged, sexually highly charged showmanship that Clapton, who was on stage, simply walked off the stage. He was totally bewildered. Ch Chandler found him in the dressing room, sort of lighting a cigarette with a trembling hand and said, I never knew he was that good. But afterwards they did become, as all these great guitarists became they adored Jimmy. He was Jimmy was adorable. So they didn't feel any animosity towards him. And as you say, there was one evening, one night, when Townsend, who is not, we think, a very sentimental soul of the Who, and Clapton were watching Jimmy, and they were sort of instinctively holding hands, like two little kids at a firework display. They didn't quite understand what they were seeing. They couldn't cope with it. They had to have mutual the mutual comfort of holding each other's hand. You know, it's interesting. You're almost the same age as Sir Paul, you're a little younger. Were you around all of this stuff as it was happening? Were you right there? I, I was certainly around because I was in London. I worked for the Sunday Times Colour magazine, which was not like a, a, a Sunday supplement at all. It was absolutely awash with money from advertising the new products of the consumer society. And I was allowed to go anywhere I really wanted in the world and interview anybody I wanted to interview. And so I did meet everybody I ever wanted to know. But they didn't include Jimmy, but they did include Clapton. And when... Uh, after Jimmy's tragic death in 1970, the New York Times asked to interview Clapton about Jimmy and, and Clapton said they were uh, okay as long as Philip Norman can do the interview. So that's the closest I came. But um, I was very close to the scene indeed, yes. But I was more concerned in those days with getting myself to America, meeting people like Stevie Wonder and B.B. King. And that's why you missed the interview with Clapton, which you regret. I do, absolutely. I mean, I request an awful lot of things because so many wonderful people around in that era that I really had access to because the Sunday Times packed such, you know, prestige. Um, that I really wish I'd, I'd gone to the clubs where Jimmy would play, but I just never had coincided with, with him. Well, so given the fact that what's so interesting and strange and unbelievable is that we have a, a, a life of adulation and stardom that lasted less than four years. And here you have Paul McCartney, who's enjoyed the same for almost 60 years. Don't you find that amazing? Well, it's even more amazing when you think that none of them expected that. The Beatles didn't expect anything like that. That's why Lennon and McCartney started writing songs for other people, because they thought that in two or three years at the most, the Beatles would just sort of, people would have got tired of the Beatles, and Lennon and McCartney would have to earn their living as jobbing songwriters. So they all thought that this was a only going to last, you know, months or a couple of years. In Jimmy's case, he had a dreadful manager, uh, Mike Jeffrey, who didn't understand Jimmy's talent at all, but realized he had novelty value. So Jimmy was put onto these one-nighters all over Britain, playing terrible out-of-the-way places, you know, just for one night with the two white musicians he was teamed with, because it was thought, you know, they just have to capitalize, monetize him as much as possible in a short time. Yeah, and uh, with Noel Redding and Mitch Mitchell, as a drummer, he was a decent drummer, but as a bassist, he didn't really have the best bassist. And, you know, I guess it really didn't matter. It was just him, but still and all, you know. Well, they were chosen because they, they mustn't detract attention from, from Jimmy. Um, Mitchell was a, a strong, you know, jazz-influenced drummer. But um, uh, Noel Redding couldn't play the bass. Jimmy had to teach him to play the bass before they started. The other interesting thing about his beginning, which I would never have thought of, was that you discussed the fact that he wasn't one of the few black musicians that wasn't influenced by church or gospel music. And that changed everything. 
That's true because all, you know that is almost a, a compulsory rite of passage. Um, you know, the training in church and in gospel music, and so his voice didn't have that sort of free song. You know that almost every other great African American musician's voice had. Uh, he first of all. Uh, he was he and his younger brother in the charge of their father who was rather disreputable drunken character and they didn't really go to church um and also jimmy was listening to white musicians he was listening to people like james burton who played uh, uh, on the ricky nelson records and buddy holly who was a fantastic guitarist at a time when white guitarists were not really sort of recognized because rock and roll was thought to be a confidence trick where people didn't really play their instruments it was all part of some kind of illusion but jimmy listened to those people and uh, you know he, he started to like surf sound in the early 60s and the beach boys um and he just brought it all and one is the great great point about jimmy as well which is so unusual is that his cover versions were often as brilliant or more brilliant than the original. So he would take a, a, a sacred, I mean, a really sacred Beatles track like Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and just reinvent it as a sort of heavy metal broadside. And again, people whose work was sort of deconstructed in that way by Jimmy, they, they loved it. McCartney said that uh, his version of the Sgt. Pepper track, Jimmy's version, was one of the greatest honors ever done to McCartney. McCartney thought that, and he was not a man who was without honors, even in those days. Yeah, it's interesting yeah. to talk about the concert where Paul heard that, and yeah, yeah, and you know, the first time around when Paul didn't think you treated him as well as maybe you should have, and I kind of actually agree with that version more, um, I did really like the fact that he was so complimentary about Sgt. Peppers, and also the fact that he was involved in getting Jimmy to Monterey. Yeah, I mean, you know, he wasn't, he didn't have that sort of same kind of instant visceral connection because he was you know, a bass player. Um, and it was really, uh, it was the, it was Brian Jones of the Stones, who was, you know, the great virtuoso of the original Rolling Stones. And people like that, who were, were Jimmy, you know, who adulated Jimmy. But McCartney recognised, of course, recognised the, the extent of this talent. And that was something, there was a generosity about all of them in those days towards each other. So there wasn't any kind of envy or backbiting. They simply recognized this man was the virtuoso and they had they deferred to him, but they also really loved him. Hey, did you, you heard, of, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of, have you read um, Utopia Avenue by um, uh, David Mitchell? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, it's, and that was especially with regard to Brian Jones. And it also seemed like Brian Jones and Jimmy had some kind of, I don't want to say astral connection, but it seemed like they were similar in a lot of ways, at least the way it's portrayed in your book. Well, they came from, you know, such different hemispheres. Brian Jones was from this town of Cheltenham in the west of England, I mean, which is, was known for sort of starchy middle class propriety, you know, and this incredible sexual buccaneer and guitar genius came out of Cheltenham. Uh, Jimmy, of course, but Jimmy came out of a very unlikely place too, which was Seattle, which is not thought to be the home of the blues, you know, or soul. And uh, um, so that yes, there was an affinity between them. They even sort of competed for the same, uh, the attention of the same young woman it was Linda Keith, who was actually Keith Richards' girlfriend of the Stones. But Linda Keith was the one who really discovered Jimmy playing in this awful club called the Cheetah Club in a sort of 10th rate backup R&B band, but still recognized he had something special about him. She was the one who took him to Chaz Chandler and Chandler then became his manager or co-manager. It's interesting that, you know, there are heroes and villains to a certain extent in your book and you can go into that if you'd like, but Linda Keith would seem like a real, in America, you'd say a real straight up person. Uh, throughout the book, she was, you know, very, yeah, loyal to him and even through the end and everything. I really, I, I really liked her. Did you know her? Well, I got to know her, in fact, yes. Uh, I guess through writing, through writing the book. And of course, so much was owed by these, you know, these first, this first generation of great British rock musicians to young women. Women who often were more sophisticated, um, knew about the blues, had, you know, uh, um, 
turn them on to other kinds of culture, like Marianne Faithful with uh, uh, with Mick Jagger, um, Anita Pallenberg, you know, the, and sometimes they were of European ancestry, which made them even more sophisticated. And Linda Keith was a, a London, uh, was brought up in London, but she just had this sort of wonderful tune. You know, she was into everything as much as any of the young men of the time, into drugs, into, but at the same time, rather sort of correctly brought up in a Jewish family and a very, very appealing and wonderful and funny woman. Well, as long as we're talking about I guess we ought to <laughs> go into that and what a life he had with regard to the number of women who would have been attracted to him, whether he was a musician or not. Well, that's true. Um, and of course, it's not a very appealing side of, you know, th this used to be, oh, those naughty rock stars, aren't they terrible? Um, we used to be indulgent towards that. Now, you know, later with later sort of attitudes, it's a, a, you know, the extreme promiscuity of those rock stars in those days is not at all appealing. But, in, but Jimmy was never a predator. That's something his friend, his fellow musician and friend Robert Wyatt said. Um, he didn't have to be a predator. He wasn't a womanizer. The women were Hendrixizers. You know, they really formed lines outside his bedroom door. Um, and he only really had to just sort of open the door, which he always did. If you go back to some of the seminal moments, well, let's start before the seminal moments. And, and because I think, and you can talk about all of his early influences, but I was particularly interested in some of it I already knew about uh, Little Richard and and perhaps some of the things that Little Richard did or possessed were kind of reflected in Jimmy's behavior and clothing and things like that. Um, well, um, sexually speaking, they were not at all, uh, um, had no affinity whatsoever. Um, but Little Richard, um, it's always said that Little Richard resented the fact that Jimmy took attention from Little Richard on stage. But Little Richard absolutely in his lifetime, insisted that he gave Jimmy a chance, gave him space on the stage. And um, but this was all great experience for Jimmy, not just for with Little Richard, with uh, Ike and Tina Turner, uh, with Wilson Pickett, with Sam Cooke, um, but he couldn't go any further than just being a sideman because of that extreme prejudice at the time, which even, someone, even like people like James Brown would have to play, you know, only these segregated venues, the Apollo in New York and other, other places. Um, in Britain, Britain was not without racism at all, but these young musicians, these young white musicians, uh, they absolutely, they, they adulated these great sort of classic, uh, these virtuosi of American soul and blues, um, and they all adored Jimmy. And he got his first real, because he came to Britain without a work permit, and, and strictly speaking, was not supposed to work. So Chas Chandler's way of slipping him into circulation was at all, all these very fashionable clubs there were in the middle 60s, like the Speakeasy and the Scotch of St. James. And that was how the Beatles and the Stones and the Kinks and the Who all got to see him. And of course, they all fell in love with him. Yeah. That's the thing is that he's in Great Britain making an incredible name for himself and yet nothing is happening in America and, and, there, and there were other things but Monterey was what really did it, wasn't it? Yes, um, in fact you know, it didn't take long for things to start happening in America and in fact you know, the Monterey Fe uh, Festival in 67 was the one where he simply you know, obliterated the, all the competition in this wonderful bill that included The Who and Janis Joplin. Um, and um, Otis Redding. But the following year, in 68, he, he went back to America. This was a terrible year in America, where the place, you know, was erupting into race riots and uh, anti-war demonstrations and terrible official rep reprisals against particularly uh, African-Americans. Here is an African-American uh, bringing two white musicians in a mixed race lineup band touring in the south in America in that year. An amazing feat of courage and endurance and resilience, um, you know, comparable with any of the great sort of deeds of the civil rights movement, because it was simply disregarding racial barriers at a time when that was just so incredibly sensitive and the country was in such turmoil. And so that was an amazing 
achievement if if he had no other achievement. Yeah, I did. Even sang about the death of Robert Kennedy and uh, Martin Luther King, just like when the Beatles came over, it was just a couple of months after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Um, yeah, it must have been tough. Um, well, when the Beatles came over, of course, that that America's you know the, the national psyche had been so shaken by this appalling deed of this the murder of this young president, and for you know the huge self-confidence America had but in its music which music belonged to America rock and roll all those genres belonged to America and no British act had really ever been allowed to you know to have, have ascendancy over American artists and suddenly all they wanted were these little little blokes with fringes you know looked sort of a bit like Hamlet um <laughs> the little boots and you know and that was that was different that was just an amazing piece of accidental brilliant timing with with Jimmy, it was going, you know, consciously into an absolute, you know, potential inferno and pulling it off and and making that tour. The tour was an awful, I mean, it lasted, there were sort of, it was in installments, but it lasted really virtually for a whole year. Um, but they did it. Yeah, it's, when you're talking about um, clothing, well, there's two things. One, it was interesting, the fact, which I didn't know, that he would immediately head for the woman's section of the boutique that he was going into. And yeah, like I was saying, I remember his outfit when I saw him at Temple. And uh, yeah, I, I was young enough that I thought, wow, this is really unusual, but it, it fit him perfectly and fit his personality perfectly. He was doing that, of course. I mean, this was when um, the, the barriers, the sartorial barriers between the sexes, like every other barrier was sort of collapsing. But much earlier than that, you know, in, around the Seattle area, um, he would decorate his guitar. He would sort of borrow his, you know, borrow his girlfriend's blouses and decorate his guitars with little feathers off the Seagram Scotch bottle. And this was considered outrageous at the time. He, but, but you know, that was that was him. He was completely himself. Which also reminds me. Tell a little bit that interesting story that connects you with Jimmy with Seattle. Uh, yes. Um, uh, my grandmother, uh, my father's mother, who was a very powerful influence in my life and really got me my job on the Sunday Times magazine, because I wrote about her and she was so weird and bizarre that I won the competition. Um, but it, she always talked when I was growing up about having emigrated to Seattle uh, um, after the, the First World War. Her much older husband uh, had died in the First World War and she with my um, yeah, uh, uncle and father and two children by her husband's first marriage all went out to Seattle. It didn't last very long. But she made it sound very sort of like a very much like the wild frontier where you know they would have a picnic in the forest and bears would run out like Yogi and Boo Boo and steal their picnics. And, and the Model T Fords always they could only go up hills backwards. Um, so, you know, I just had this picture growing up of these steep hills with Model T Fords and bears stealing picnics. And uh, so when I came to write about Jimmy, I couldn't leave that out, really. Yeah, did you, did you take a trip back to talk to Jimmy? Did you, I know you got a lot out of Jimmy's brother, and um, I was wondering whether you had actually gone back to Seattle and what you thought. Uh, I, had, I, I did go back there, but it was with, um, it was actually uh, writing about someone else, it was writing about R Roberta Flack. Um, and I was actually in New York writing about soul music for the Sunday Times and Roberta Flack was going to Seattle to appear. And I thought, oh, well, I'll go along. So I went along with her and I did see the, the center of the city. Of course, there was a monorail. There were no more steep hills. Of course, no more Model, model T Fords either. Yeah, it's an interesting city, except it's always raining. Um, but that's the same as London. I guess it's very similar to London in that way. Um, this is so... Uh, the book kind of is in, is in the shape of an arc. And so I guess the next question would be is if you could expound a bit on, you know, what happened when he began to reach his height and then began to disintegrate towards what happened at the end, which we'll also talk about. Well, after four years, uh, apart from anything else, he was physically exhausted. He had been worked really into the ground. Um, but uh, 
his management um, booked him uh, to appear on the Isle of Wight. Now, the Isle of Wight is off the south coast of uh, England. I grew up there. Um, it's a little diamond-shaped island uh, where, like most islands, it's 20 years behind the times. Um, and uh, But in the 60s, these uh, brothers, uh, three brothers, uh, had three enormous pop festivals on the Isle of Wight. The first one nobody really noticed. Um, had Jefferson Airplane, The Crazy World of Arthur Brown. That was quite small scale. But for the second one, uh, the, they managed, the brothers, their name was Ro Ronnie and Ray and Bill Falk, they managed to get Bob Dylan to go to the Isle of Wight in 1969 instead of going to Woodstock. Uh, they did it by finding out that um, one of Dylan's uh, favourite poet, poets was Alfred Lord Tennyson who had lived on the Isle of Wight, on the west of the Isle of Wight. And so they managed to persuade Dylan to go there. And this was really ties in with the Jimmy book because Jimmy was living in Woodstock at that time. Dylan lived at Woodstock as a sort of area, not just little, one little town. It's now generically a sort of enchanted land of musicians because of Dylan mainly being there and also the festival. So Jimmy was living in Woodstock and hoping to bump into Dylan. And Dylan was on the Isle of Wight. Uh, and then the following year, uh, which was the third festival, which was almost a half a million people, nearly as big as Woodstock on this little island. They used to wear, the, the, the people at the festival wore badges at the Dylan festival saying, help Bob Dylan sink the Isle of Wight. Uh, but then Jimmy uh, co-headlined that with uh, the doors and a huge, a three day, amazing bill of artistes. But after that, he had to do a terrible, terrible uh, European tour. He was totally exhausted, which ended in, a, on, by then the Altamont Festival had happened, which was really the end of the smiling golden sunny 60s. The Rolling Stones had played uh, this Altamont, this uh, speed, this raceway, this stock car track in Livermore in California. And the Hells Angels so-called security had run amok. And, and someone had been killed in front of the stones on stage. And this was kind of replicated on this island in the, uh, off the coast of Germany, Fermann was called. And the final sort of uh, Jimi Hendrix experience uh, appearance there before returning to London, again, was everybody ran amok. It was like a little Altamont. Um, he returned to London. There were lots of troubles, lots of problems. He was trying to get away from his manager, Mike Jeffrey. There was a paternity suit, um, lots of things that he didn't like to really facing up to. Um, and it was when he, re he returned to London from that um, European tour that he, he died in this very, you know, po uh, solitary, lonely, squalid surroundings in Notting Hill in West London, in this basement apartment, bed sitting room, not even an apartment really, uh, where he was staying with a, a, a German ice skater, or former ice skating champion um, called Monica Dannemann, who was sort of, I kind of got hold of him really. He could, Jimmy couldn't say no to anybody. And Monica he'd met and had a couple of uh, rendezvous with in, in Germany over the last couple, previous couple of years. But he was with Monica uh, the night that he died. And um, the story was never really straight from Monica at all, what had happened. What, what had really happened was that he was staying there with Monica in this little, uh, little bed sitting room in a basement when he was actually registered at a very good hotel at the Cumberland. If he'd stayed at the Cumberland, he would have been fine. But he was with Monica, he took some sleeping pills. He didn't realize that every pill was a double dose. So he thought he was having, you know, four or five, but he was having twice that amount. And in his terrible low state of health, um, he, he just, it just, it was too much for him. And he asphyxiated um, on, on his own vomit. Um, but what the terrible part of the story is that um, there was a discrepancy between the time that Monica had called desperately for help and the time when the ambulance went to this place was several hours. And during that time, he might well have been resuscitated and, and have been saved. Yeah, I know. 
there's so many things towards the end that, well, you know, the way you, you say that um, uh, we have, she changed her mind or changed her story some 14 times and the way that even Eric Burton felt uh, uh, guilty about his death. And then the Vesperox, I guess, maybe pronounced that way. I mean, uh, all of those tablets would point directly to suicide, but you kind of leave some of it up to the reader um, because I'd have to say when I, when I finished, and then I reread it in, in preparation for this, you know, I really can't decide in my own mind, well, obviously, which of her 14 stories is correct, and also the part where um, the one physician or attendant had noted all the red wine. So there were some major inconsistencies. There were, I mean, I think it's clear that it was a tragic, uh, an avoidable accident. Um, but he was in the sort of in the kind of grip of a what we would now call an obsessive fan, perhaps even a stalker in this young woman, Monica Daneman. Um, he could really get away from her. Um, but the, the other theories, uh, one of the other theories is that it was the American government because he was such a figure of you know, unifying had such influence over young white audiences. Um, he was now speaking out about against the Vietnam War, playing that amazing a cappella version of the Star Spangled Banner at Woodstock, doing things like that. The CIA and the uh, FBI were both surveilling him um, and hoping to get something on him, though they never actually did manage to put, it, put him away at all. Um, he, he was busted once for drugs, but he was, in the end, it was, he went to trial and got, got got off. Uh, the other uh, theory was that it could have been the Mafia, because indeed he was kidnapped by the Mafia a few months earlier, just after Woodstock. Um, young mafiosi wanted to move into the music business, um, but he was released by intercession with senior mafiosi who were connected with his record company, which had been started by Frank Sinatra, so naturally did have some affinity with organized crime, or had had at one time. Yeah. Um, so so that, you know, the, the various theories all have a bit of credibility, but I, it, it seems to me quite clear it was a tragic, avoidable accident. If he had stayed at the Cumberland Hotel, he would have been fine. Yep. Yeah. It's interesting to with that is the fact that that one situation where he saw Marilyn Monroe in the mirror as its reflection and then as he had these various premonitions you know saying I won't get to the past the age of 30 and some of the lyrics in his music that was fascinating too. Um, well and, and in fact the only vacation he ever really had um, was to go to Morocco and, and kind of reconnected with the African roots very much so um and yes uh, um he had his the tarot cards read there and um the young woman he was with it was her a member of her family and after that he was literally counting down the days you know he said he wasn't going to be here much longer yeah it's um uh, yeah it's it, you know that that's that's the thing it, it is a fascinating story in all your other books, too, they're fascinating as well, but there's something, well, I know you haven't written about anybody who died, have you? Wait a minute. Uh, well, John Lennon, uh, oh, yeah, but, but Buddy Holly, uh, you know, a very, another tragic early death. But with Jim, it's quite hard to find in this milieu um, someone who really is a, a, a lovely character, sweet and adorable character. He had his, you know, had his dark side, um, but everybody remembered him as so very sweet and so very nice. Um, and those are not words that you find a lot in the rock world. And um, I, I try to convey that it's quite hard. You know, Charles Dickens is one of the very few people who could communicate goodness in a person in an interesting way. It's quite a challenge for a writer. It's easy to sort of you know a lot of these people are monsters i mean but if you're writing a biography you have to even if it's a monster you have to love your monster it's no good like being you know albert goldman and just taking 800 pages to slag somebody off you have to empathize with them and it's very easy to empathize with jimmy as it was with buddy holly and of course with john lennon yeah and also the ways you did it which really 
shown through uh, was the way that um, when he had a girlfriend or something and then he would go home and meet their mother um, and he would always remember to give them a present and the mother would always kiss him. And that's a real, that's a real good way of showing if you're a good person or not. It is, although he wasn't so very nice to the, to the young women, <laughs> like their mothers more perhaps. Yes, and uh, um, because he still felt the loss of his mother, to, who had a you know, very sad and early death, alcoholism at the age of 32. He said, he told um, several other women later on, he could still smell uh, his mother's perfume. You remember the smell of his mother's perfume? And, and the lyrics of, um, I've forgotten the song, the lyrics that refer to his mother. Um, Castles made of sand, yes. Right. Oh, and uh, Spanish Castle uh, Magic was also about that specifically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess I didn't really think about it, but a lot of the music was actually autobiographical, wasn't it? Yes, or, or it had a sort of more of an impressionistic sort of effect of, you know, a, a reference that if you could pick up, if you knew the story, he didn't tell, you know, vivid strip cartoon stories about his life the way that McCartney would do. But um, yes, there is a there is a life, and, there, and particularly on the first couple of albums, uh, that's especially true. Yeah, that is also amazing. The Beatles putting out whatever it is, 42, and he just basically having, are you experiencing Axis of Love and Electric Ladyland and pretty much other than all the bootleg stuff. It's basically, for the layman, it's three albums, which is amazing to me. It is, and of course, they were all wonderful albums and, uh, and you know, Electric Ladyland in particular for me. Yes. All along, the, all along the watchtower. Yeah, and you do talk about twice, kind of in the prologue and then in the interior of the book, about the manner in which he changed what Dylan had created. And that was what, so, uh, what you were saying earlier about the covers. Um, Sometimes he made the cover better than the original song and um, the manner in which he did all along the watchtower, I've always thought. And there's so many people who have done it, including Dave Mason. Um, but I, I do feel that his is the most, I don't know, you take somebody else's words and make them more authentic. Yeah, and of course, you know, the, in fact, the Dylan original isn't that distinguished to be. No. It's, um, it, and the, the lyrics sound very sort of forced and pretentious, and Jimmy sort of sings about such utter conviction, it never crosses your mind that anything other than is totally serious. I like the way said, I forgot who it was, but you can't really walk along a watchtower, Jimmy. <laughs> oh, yes, you can't, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't matter. Uh, uh, the other thing that was interesting is I remember that concert for George and Prince doing uh, While My Guitar Gently Weeps and just kind of everybody else just kind of disappeared. And I thought of how Prince actually, uh, at least he wanted to be, uh, the inheritor of a lot of Jimmy's uh, characteristics. What do you think about that? Do you think he's been successful? He was successful at that? I think it was very, very different. I mean, he, he, he looked a little like Jimmy. I think he was just so different and great original. Um, <clears throat> but there was this, you know, this wildness in Jimmy. That's a wild thing indeed. Um, and so different from the way he was off stage. Um, you know, and uh, the, the way that guitar sort of soars into sort of like a sort of it's like Pavarotti somehow. You think it can't go any higher, but it does uh, in that four, that great solo, the greatest guitar solo of all time, I think is the All Along the Watchtower solo. Yeah. And, but, you know, it's funny to think about this solo by David Gilmore and Comfortably Numb, and I've always thought that was incredible, but there's something completely different about that's completely different about the solo. You know what it's like, I've always thought, at least in America, you know, you have Michael Jordan and you have uh, Tiger Woods. And I've always sort of looked at it like they were actually playing a different game. Like, like, like Tiger Woods wasn't playing golf, he was playing a different game. Michael Jordan, even if he had been on the court by himself, still would have prevailed. And that's how I think about Jimmy is that he was actually playing a different game than everybody else. That's true, or such a supreme example, like a supreme example of anything is fascinating, whether it's golf or motor racing or playing the guitar. So you don't have to like heavy metal 
to love Jimmy. You don't have to like reggae to love Bob Marley. You know, it's on its own. It defies categorization. Yeah, that's very true. Well, I guess in, in conclusion, I mean, it doesn't seem like you're ready to stop doing this. And um, I was wondering, like, for example, take Jim Morrison. Do you intend to ever undertake a biography of Jim Morrison on the doors? I have thought about it. I, there are so many, uh, you know, no. it, doesn't, it doesn't mean they're any good, but there are just so many in number. Um, and uh, I have thought about that, yes, because he, he was extraordinary as well. Um, and one of those tragic, you know, members of the so-called 27 Club. But I can tell you the temptation not to do another of these books is very, very strong. <laughs> because uh, um, it is so very hard to write a real book, a piece of you know, something with aspirations to being literature about something like rock music, which is so full of dross. You know, a tiny percentage is not dross, of course, but you have to deal with the dross as well. You have to think of an interesting way of saying the record went to number 33 in Billboard Top 100. How can you say that in an original, interesting way? But you have to somehow. Well, I, and, and you've done a very good job of it for a number of reasons. One, because you're a contemporary of all these people. Two, because your research is so copious and so well done, and then the way you write. And um, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's so wonderful for me because I remember these people so well and you give so many insights. So I wanted to thank you for being here and thanks for sharing. And I hope I didn't go on too long about my own life. <laughs> not at all, not at all. These are all bound up with personal experience, transfiguring moments, of course they are. Yeah. Very nice to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.